I recognize that voice up there. How about you guys? All right. I'm, uh, I'm Dan. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. If you're new here, welcome. I'm glad that you are here. Um, there's a yellow card on the chair in front of you. If you could take a moment sometime during the service, just go ahead and begin to fill that out. Um, like Ron likes to say, if this is your first, we hope it's not your last. Ron just has sayings like that. Have you guys noticed that? <laughs> and uh, so make sure it's not your last. Maybe that can be your little message. My name is, and this is not going to be my last because I got to wait to hear Ron speak because I don't know who you are. That's fine. <laughs> All right, And our ladies in the office, they love it when you guys bring in the prayer requests, and the pastors love it because then we get to pray for them. Um, it keeps them busy, and it keeps us on our knees praying. So if you've got a prayer request, be sure to put that in there, and just put it in the offering box on the side, give it to somebody, and we'll make sure it gets where it needs to go. Man, so today's sermon, man, if we can get this, say, I got this, I got this. If we can get this, and, and this is what we need to get, God knows everything. Is that pretty simple? He knows everything. And for you, everything is a choice. Is that simple too? So God knows everything, and for us, everything is a choice. If we can just soak that in today, uh, it's a win. And uh, you guys already know that cognitively, but what we need to do is just kind of get it right in here saying, you know what, that's right, God knows everything, nothing's hidden from him. He knows every little thing about me. He knows all my sniffling little weaknesses, and he knows my strengths. He knows my fears. He's got me. And everything that's presented before me is a choice. Nobody's making my own decisions for me on my behalf. I'm old enough. Everything that I do is a choice. And whenever I come up here and I try to share, I try to be as raw and as vulnerable as I can be. That's just kind of my style. Ron and Ryan, they are too. I'm just saying, you know what, they're just great teachers. That's just not who I am. I'm not apologizing, so I don't need any odds out there. I'm just saying, I just teach different. I like the way I teach. I'm okay. I'm just saying, they're just fantastic teachers. I just don't normally absorb myself into the poetic structure of the passage. You know what I'm getting to? I just don't go into all academia, and they're not doing that all academia stuff too. I'm just saying, they're just more of a teacher approach than I am. Trying to find the symmetry between the first and the second and the second half of another teaching. They got, a, they got these paragraphs of, of eight sets and they divide them in half. And the first four are framed in terms of something I have no idea what he's talking about sometimes. And the second half are framed in relation to it as well. And he'll drop words like alliteration. And I'm like, alliteration? Okay, I know the word. But why did you drop that, you know? And asphoristic diction, I'm like, I don't even, what is asphoristic diction? And, and I have to look these things up. I feel like I'm back at Jack Hayford's church. And if he said it, I, I got to go with it. And then I got to look it up later. And then we have these amazing one-liners like Ron. You know, like keep the fire in the fireplace, right? <laughs> I'm like, hey, how many, goes, how many have used that line outside of church now? Oh, wait a minute. I would have thought like, yeah, I've talked to many people. Keep the fire in the fireplace, would you? Don't put it in your lap. Don't put it in the couch, you know? But you know what? I love that. They have such great strengths, and I've just got a different one, I think. I just like to keep it real. I like to keep it raw. And everything that flows out of me, I feel like it flows out of my love relationship with the Word of God. It flows out of my love relationship with God. And I just try to insert myself into the passage. Like, God, what are you speaking to me? God, what do you want to show me when I'm reading this? What are you telling me? Give me a message. Give me a theme. God, just give me a word for today. (laughs) Came to me. It's warning. God wants to give me a warning. He wants to give this church a warning today. And that's what 2 Corinthians 10 that we're launching into is all about. I just want to raise the stakes this morning. I mean, I just want to raise the awareness level. I mean, I just want to heighten and increase your sensitivity to there's a warning that Paul writes in the Bible right here in today's passage. And he's telling us that we need to remember this. That this is an example for us to look at. And this isn't just something like, hey, remember the Alamo. That doesn't change my life that much, right? Or remember Independence Day, the 4th of July. Remember anniversaries and birthdays. This is something completely different. The chapter, the title of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is this, warnings. 
from Israel's history. And if I wasn't the one studying the passage this week, I would have just read it and been like, okay, that's just a title. I don't just hang up my, uh, my code on the titles, man, like, and figure out what's this all about. But today, it would do good for you and I to just go, what are the warnings that Paul is talking about from Israel's history? Paul is warning the Corinthian church to beware of making the same mistakes that the Israelites made. That Israel's sin of idolatrous behaviors are not going to be tolerated. And the Corinthian church was doing that which Israel had done thousands of years ago. And that's why Paul comes and he writes this letter and says, man, stop what you're doing. I need you to wake up and look at what's happening around you. If he didn't tolerate the sins of Israel, the church of Corinth, the church of Gateway, guess what? He's not going to tolerate yours either. We think he might. He might just look the other way. But the truth is, he's not. Remember the city of Corinth. You know, when I first started looking into Corinth, I was like, man, Paul had it so lucky. We think about people who go on missionary journeys. Like, man, I'm going to go to like Hawaii or these exotic, beautiful places and be a missionary. And that's Corinth. That's Athens. That's the Mediterranean. That's Greece. And this is where Paul is preaching the gospel, right? And there's very few cities that ever had such the same reputation that Corinth had. It was one of the most dominant cultural cities of its time. One of the most influential. It had three harbors, which made it the crossroads section for trade in that part of the world. The sailors and the merchants would flood into this town of about 400,000 people. It sounds a little bit like Santa Cruz in, in size. It was one of the largest, modern, and most beautiful cities. It's one of those cities you go on vacation today to go see. I want to go see Greece, right? I want to see those pillars and the columns of the Temple of Apollo. It'd be beautiful to see that. I want to see that old structure, right, of Greek mythology. There were several temples in the city. We learned about one being Aphrodite, the goddess of love. But there are a couple other temples that were there. Poseidon, the ruler of the sea, right? There was a temple there for him. And Apollos, the god of archery and music and dance. And Hermes, the messenger god. All these things that you would love to see in its day. And Paul is there. That's where he's preaching. This city with all these temples. This beautiful city that was the, the center of trade in that region. But you know, as, as Ron's been teaching for about a month and a half now in this place, it was also known as Sin City. It was the center of corruption. You guys know cities like that? I mean, Sin City. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Vegas, Vegas right? And it could be other major cities like even San Francisco. I mean, and so Paul chooses this place, this pagan city that is just filled with moral corruption where the temple of Aphrodite is there and there's a thousand temple prostitutes, right? And it says that every evening, you can just kind of visualize. This is, how I, this is why I preach this way. I visualize everything. And it says that these temple prostitutes which just come down the mountain. It almost feels evil, like the movie The Fog, it's just they come down the mountain and the hill where the sailors are waiting, and they've got their money, and they're ready to spend it. It almost sounds like a scene out of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Isn't that kind of the picture? And here comes all of this filthy, sinful, idolatry, sexual immorality, and it's in the middle of this city that Paul says, I'm going to plant a church in the darkest, most corrupt city in the world. And I was like, what was he thinking? Why would Paul go there? Of all places, this isn't the place I thought it was when I read about 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and all these other books that Paul wrote. This isn't the picture that I had of where, of where Paul was writing and where Paul was establishing churches. But why would Paul start a church there of all places? And I'm sure Paul was thinking this. What better place would there be to set men free by the grace of God than to go to the deepest, darkest dungeon on earth? Isn't that the place Paul would go? That's totally where he would go. Sin City, Corinth. No wonder why this church had so many problems. It makes sense when we listen to what Ron's been teaching about and Ron's been teaching as well that Paul had to address the issues of sexual immorality. He had to deal with the issues of idolatry, 
about divorce and marriage and church discipline and Christian liberty. No wonder that he had to go through all this stuff because the church was filled with it. It was sin city, and they had to figure out a way how to get out of it, and Paul's going to say, hey, don't think you can play with this. If God's not going to tolerate it with the Israelites, he's not going to tolerate it with you. You need to be a people set apart. You need to come out. And so with that background, I want us to look at Exodus chapter 32 this morning because this is what Paul references, the warning to the city of Corinth, the warning to you and I about what happened to Israel back in Exodus chapter 32. And also, if you look in your notes, I put a couple other passages there for Numbers chapter 14, 16 for your own reference. But this is what it says in Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and they said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing that you guys got from Egypt and bring them to me. And so all the people took off their earrings, and they brought them to Aaron. He took what they had handed him, and he made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. A lot of work went into this. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar, took one more step forward in front of that calf, and he announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord, not the Lord God, but to this false one. And so the next day, the people rose early. Imagine that. They just couldn't wait. And they sacrificed burnt offerings, and they presented fellowship offerings. They copied the worship of God here. And afterward, they sat down to eat and drink, and they got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt they have become quick. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them. And they have made themselves an idol, and they cast it in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it, and they have sacrificed to it. And they have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked. Now leave me alone so that my anger can burn against them and that I may destroy them, and I will make you into a great nation. Paul's going to reference this as well as other things. But now let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul references Exodus 32. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, he's talking to the church now, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, they all ate the same spiritual food, and they drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered, in other words, for dead, in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as an example to keep, as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as, the, as they did. What things? Do not be an idolater, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they got up to indulge in revelry. You should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. Are you seeing the pattern here? He's warning them, don't do this. Why? You get bit by snakes, you get wiped out by a plague, you're going to be killed. And the last one, do not grumble as some of them did, and they were killed by the destroying angel. Man, if you got your own personal Bible, this is the kind of stuff you just want to start circling and underlining what not to do. What are the warnings? What are they doing? And these things happen as ex to them as examples, and they were written down as warnings for you and I, as for us, who on the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you 
except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. There's such hope and promise to that. The Israelites could have done it. The church of Corinth, they can do it. You can do it. It's like I said, if you know this, God knows everything, and that everything that you do is a choice, you're going to figure out today what you ought to do with this message. What can we learn from history? What can we learn from the Israelites? What can we learn from what Paul is saying and putting in the face of the church of Corinth? He says, these things are examples and they're written down to warn us. Sometimes I can read the Old Testament, man. I'm just thinking, how can they be so dense, right? After everything that they saw, after everything that they witnessed, how can they make lame decision after lame decision again and again and again? How could they compromise? How could they do that after everything? How could they keep blowing it? And that's where Paul is quick to just jump in your face as he jumped into the face of the church of Corinth. And he says, be careful. Be careful that you don't fall because you're not any better. Don't think you're any better. You should learn from their example and don't make the same mistakes that they made. How many guys are just sitting here right now thinking, I've got some of this in my life right now. This is a warning to you right now this morning. These things, Paul says, are in your church. These things are in the church of Corinth. These things, I think, are in our lives. And Paul says, this is a warning. And, and we're going to talk about those things this morning. Beware, when they committed idolatry and they worshiped that golden calf, or whatever that golden calf is, when they committed sexual immorality, when they ate and drank and they danced, they had their religious orgies, when they worshiped Baal, God put over 20,000 of them to death in one day. God doesn't take it light. When they grumbled and complained against God and against Moses, they're saying, man, uh, man, uh, this bread from heaven, we don't like this stuff. God sent snakes, and it devastated their community. They, were, they would die by the bite of a snake because they grumbled and complained. Have you ever caught yourself grumbling and complaining about your life? People of Corinth, Paul says, beware, take heed. And he didn't say that to them for no reason. He said that there's a warning here because I don't want to see what happened to our ancestors happen today in this church, this church that I love, Paul says, that he planted, that he founded, and that he's, he's nurturing and discipling. He said if God did it to them, and he loves these people, right, Paul does, he's going to do it to you. He didn't tolerate Israel's sin, and he's not going to tolerate that behavior out of my life as well, or out of them. And maybe your sin's not that big of a deal to you, or maybe the sin around you is not that big of a deal to you either, but you know who it's a big deal to? It's a big deal to him. How many guys say you do rationalize sin? It's not that big a deal. I got a God who forgives. I'm not harming anybody. I'm still alive tomorrow. Ah, stupid. Those are my thoughts. I sometimes think my sin's not a big deal. And that's why it's good to have this message today. Paul says, dude, it's a big deal to God. I mean, do we take God seriously? Does he really mean what he says? You should have no idols. You shouldn't commit these sexual immoral acts. That you shouldn't be grumbling and complaining and testing me. Does God really want me to avoid that? Does he really not want me to look at that or to touch that stuff? Do, we, you, do you really think that God is somehow okay with that behavior of greed and selfishness? That he just says, fine. You're, you don't even treat your kids that way, saying it's okay the way they behave, right? And so think about it. God is your father. He says, it's not okay to have this in your life. It's not okay for you to, believe, to behave that way. Because God really does care about you. He loves you. He doesn't want to just watch you fall over and over again. You don't like to see that in your kids, right? You discipline them because you love them. And this is a warning to us. And there are four warnings that Paul gives us. 
in this passage right here to the Corinthian church, to you specifically. These are the things that God dealt with. And this, these are the things that we need to deal with in our own lives. The first thing is, God says, I want you to guard against idolatry. You remember the story. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt, right? And they began to cry out to God, and God sees their suffering. And so he delivers them miraculously. And they experience plague after plague after plague, but the, the Hebrews didn't experience any of it, right? And then it culminated in the Passover. And they're seeing all these things happen before their eyes. And so God brings them out of Egypt, and they just start hiking through the desert, and they make it to this place called the Red Sea, and they're stuck. Now what are they going to do? And now guess what God does? He splits the Red Sea in half, so much so that it says that they walked on dry ground, and every single one of them made it across, and when everyone made it across, they turn around, and then guess what happened? You guys know the story. The Red Sea just collapsed on top of the Egyptians. I mean, they witnessed this. They saw all this. This is fresh in their mind, in their sight. They see all of this. And then they're hungry. And God rains down bread from heaven. You're just like, what? Dude, if you heard that story on the news today, if that were happening in Israel, wouldn't that just be like, it is God. He's raining down bread from heaven for his people, right? And this is what they got when they're thirsty in the middle of a desert, right? Right? They get water from a rock. That's bizarre, people. I don't, you don't see it very often unless you go to Yosemite. That's called a waterfall. This is totally different. <laughs> and then God is leading them, right? They're seeing this, a pillar of cloud. And I'm sure it's not like a little uh, Snoopy cloud. Or that other guy that's on uh, Peanuts. Isn't there a cloud that follows this guy around all the time? Pigpen? Pigpen? Yeah. I'm sure it's not that. I'm sure it's a magnificent thing for a million some odd people to see. There's a cloud that they're following by day. It's a fire just right by night. And then God brings them to a mountain, right? And here at this mountain, he reveals his glory, his all-consuming fire, the thunder of it all the witnessing of all of the stuff, and he gives them the law, and they enter into a covenant with them, right? And while Moses is on in this mountain, and he's meeting with God, he's getting his word, we read this, that the people said, Moses, it's taken too long. After everything they saw, Moses is taken too long. We don't know what's happened to him. So Aaron, here's some gold. Make us an idol, can you imagine after everything that you saw, they want something deaf and dumb and dead. They want like a piece of rock. They want a piece of gold instead. And God gets upset with that. And sometimes we've done the same thing. We want something that dumb and deaf and dead when you've got the real thing. You say, but this is better. We want this. And that's what the people were saying. I mean, it was just like that they made that decision. It was just too quick. The people saw his glory, they saw his power, they saw his deliverance, they saw his salvation, they saw all this stuff before the blood even had a chance to dry. And in a matter of days, they go to their leader and they say, make us an idol. Make us a false god that we can worship. We want that because Moses has just disappeared. And you're like, what? Seriously? Like, really? You're that quick? to turn away from God and to live your life for something else. You know what's crazy dangerous? Is that Aaron went along with it. He gave them what they wanted. He said, man, take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters got from Egypt. Give them to me and I'll make this for you. And I'll build an altar and we'll sacrifice to it. The leader gave a sinful people exactly what they wanted. That's what, the church, that's what the world is asking from the church right now. They don't want the truth. Give us exactly what we want to hear. Tell me that I'm, a, I'm okay to live my life the way I want to live my life, right? We hear that. Aren't you glad that Ron in this church is like not behaving that way? That Ron is willing? That he's willing to, to teach the hard stuff. Sometimes I kind of go, uh-oh, 
<laughs> oh, no, you did it. How many of you guys, I've had that response. I know some of you guys have had that too. You didn't just say that or go there. Oh, yeah, he did. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, snap. I wonder he's coming back tomorrow, All right? You know that he's just bold, speaking and standing for the truth. I know God is happy with this church of 300, 500. We don't need to be a mega church for God to be happy with us. God's happy with us standing for the truth and saying that which isn't easy. Sometimes we're at risk of just offending people. That's all right. This church may be losing people and not coming back next week. That's all right. I just want the truth. I want the real thing. I want the real thing. And parents, this message is for you too. Don't fall in that trap of making idols for your kids. We do this sometimes, right? We help create idols for them. Man, that sports becomes so important. You know, you got to be the best. You got to be the MVP. You got to practice. You got to do more and more, right? Or academics become so important. You got to be that 4.0. But I guess today you can be a 5.2. <laughs> Whatever. Maybe I could have been. Give me some uh, bonus points or something. Kind of like that participation trophy now. No, I'm just kidding. If you got a 5.2, that's cool. You know, and that you got to get this scholarship and then you put all this pressure and that this becomes their top priority and not God. What becomes their top priority is sports and academics, success and money, all that pressure. No wonder why sometimes they're empty at the end of all this. Or it just leads to just moral failure. You see, God is more interested in the sanctity of his people than he is in the success of his people. He's looking for a holy church, right? He's looking for a, a bride that wants to, to follow him and be like him. And there's a lot of people that are just more interested in being successful. They want more money. They want bigger houses. They want more houses. It's just never enough, right? And God says, I just want you to have more of me. Let that be the first, not the last. Sometimes we make that the last. We'll, we'll achieve everything that the world has to offer and then try to say, how can I please God in the midst of all that? Rather than just pursuing everything that we can with God and then just kind of go, you know what? How can I give my best to my work and to my employees or to my employer? You know what I mean? That we pursue success first is sometimes our mistake. Not everybody, but a lot of people, they're trying to go after the success of it all. Amen. And a lot of people are likely committing this sin of idolatry without even knowing it. You don't like to put that name on it, but that's what it is, people. It's idolatry. If you want that more than God. You know, I got to have a bigger practice. I got to have a bigger business. I got to have more money. I need a bigger account. I need a bigger, better savings, more stock, more portfolio, whatever. Whatever. Man, I want to present six maybe modern-day idols this morning. Some of you are going to be like, oh, snap, I know. you don't even have to say it. I know what those things are, you know. You know, some of these things are taking over our life. One of them is work. A lot of us guys, we see our identity in work. Man, what's the first thing that usually comes out of somebody's mouth when you meet them? Hey, what do you do? You know, and you kind of want to ask, how much do you make? But you don't go there. How successful are you? You know what I mean? What do you do and how successful are you? Does that come out of the conversation? You know, like we, we wrap ourselves in the identity of what we give ourselves to. And a lot of us, we just give ourselves to work 30, 40, 50 years, a slave to that. We find our significance in that, you know? And if you take work away and you're like devastated, you don't need to be, right? We look for work to to give us our security and not the Lord. Man, if, if you're looking for all that in work, it's an idol. Man, I can think of family members, and I'm thinking immediate family. Maybe they're watching. Um, they work so hard. Man, they're such hard workers. And sometimes I know what they're thinking is, man, I'm doing all of this for my family. But what you're doing is you're putting it before your family. That's really what happens. Sometimes we're saying, we're doing this all for the family. And it's like, huh, you're putting it before your family sometimes. Not all of us, just some of us are guilty of that. That's idolatry. Success. God wants you to be successful. Man, I know that. 
You know, I mean, I don't think he says, I want everybody just to be homeless and poor. That's not God's plan and purpose for your life. God is okay with your success. He doesn't desire success to take place in your hearts. That that is what you desire more than anything else. I need to be successful. We hear stories that come out of Hollywood, that come out of uh, the music industry, people that have sold their soul, right? They've made agreements. If you, if you follow any of those stories, how some of these people went from obscurity to all of a sudden mass popularity, there's something behind there sometimes, you know, that success means more than anything else. That's idolatry. Your phones or whatever shiny object you've got, I don't know if you've looked at it in the last five minutes. You know, it's almost noon. Oh, no, not noon. Almost 11. Right. But it's like, um, have you looked at that shiny object? Have you been given more attention to that phone than you do your loved ones? Could be an idol. Because are you, would you rather be without your spouse or without your phone for a day? Like, oh, I can't be without my phone. My spouse can leave, but my phone, I'm going home. Got to have that. It's got such a chain on us, right? Some of you, it's your image. Not everybody, but if you're totally into Facebook and Instagram and TikTok or whatever, you're just obsessed with putting this thing out there, right? Obsessed with a perfect shot, the perfect life, the perfect kids, the perfect vacation, right? And people make a lot of money doing this. But God doesn't want that for you. What he really wants for you is he wants you to find joy in him, not in yourself. And all that does is put all this joy in yourself when you are so obsessed with what you're putting on that phone for the rest of the world to see. They need to see that I'm happy. They need to see that I've got it going on. I got the best girlfriend, best boyfriend, the best sunset, the best party. You know what I mean? And, and you got to do it again. Another photo, another photo. You're obsessed with looking so good. God says, man, just find your joy in me. It could be an idol that you want to make yourself look so good. Materialism, money, sports, and entertainment. You know, 5,000 is not enough. It goes to 10. 10 is not enough. 10 goes to 50,000. You make a million, you want 2 million. If you make two, you want five. If you make five, you want ten. It's like there's no cap. You keep wanting to build upon it more and more. You've got enough. But yet you're still striving after the more. God's taking care of you, and you're like, it's not enough. That could be an idol. Your 401k, your stocks, your rental properties, whatever it is, that entertainment, the vacations, whatever. And Paul says, I warn you to guard yourself against idolatry. It is in our face. What are you going to do about it? The next warning Paul warns about is against sexual morality. He reminds us of God's judgment against the Israelite men when they were seduced by the Moabite women. And then they began to worship with them and follow and worship Moab. God was so sick of that that he decimated them with that. You know, that sexual morality. And Paul is warning the church of Corinth because this is exactly where they're at. And he says, get away from the sexual immorality. Paul says, God decimated Israel. He's going to decimate you if you start going down that path. Paul warns against the testing of God. What does it mean to test God? Test his goodness, to test his faithfulness, to test his patience. And when the Israelites were in the in the wilderness, they're just wandering around. It's 40 years a long time, wandering around one mountain. And they go around and around and around. Finally, near the end of that season, right, Gus says, we're not going around this mountain anymore. We're going back to the promised land, right? And so they, they tested God's patience by complaining. We don't have bread. We don't have water. Have you taken us out of Egypt just so that we could die in the desert, so we could die in the wilderness? And we hate this food. We're tired of this food. And they just start mumbling and complaining. And God responds by sending a horde of poisonous snakes, you know, and they're just dying now because of the snake, because of their grumbling, really. And so Moses is, is told by God, go ahead, now make a snake and wrap it around a pole. And anyone who's been bitten, if they look at this pole, they'll live. And so when the camp was just being bitten by these snakes, they'd have to look at this pole, and they would live. And God, and God is, is telling his people right now through Paul, saying, hey, stop testing me. And this last one, stop grumbling. You're grumbling and complaining. 
We find them complaining when they go to the promised land. Here they've come out of the Red Sea, and he marches them to the promised land, and they send in spies. The spies come back, and they go, oh, no, right? They're big, they're powerful, they're strong. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. This is no good. There's no way that we can conquer this, this land. Except Joshua and Caleb felt differently, right? And, uh, and it says that all night they wept and they grumbled. They just didn't do it for five or ten minutes. All night, it says that there was weeping and grumbling by the people. Here they are. God's taken them out of Egypt. He split the sea. They're right here at the doorstep of the promised land. And they're like, nope, we're not going in. Short time later, they complain again about Moses' leadership. Who made you leader over us? Who chose you? You know, I think we want to go with someone else. And, uh, and so again, then guess what happens there? God responds to that complaining, to that challenge, right? And when they're at the edge of, uh, of the promised land, God says, all right, then don't go in. Go back this way. And so they leave and they go the opposite direction in the promised land. And now they're wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until every last one of them died, except for Joshua and Caleb. And when they challenge Moses' leadership, God says, all right, man, everybody better step away because I'm opening up the ground. And Korah and his sons, 250 people in all, got swallowed up by the ground. And Israel's response wasn't like, oh, we should follow Moses. Their response was this, Moses, you just killed them. It's your fault, right? And God says, all right, back up, (laughs) right? Now God's going to judge them again, right? And what was God's response to the people complaining and grumbling again against Moses? He sent a plague, and over 14,000 people died right there. You think God's okay with idolatry? You think he's okay with sexual immorality and your grumbling and complaining and the testing? See, God didn't tolerate the sins of Israel. And Paul is seeing the sins happening in the Corinthian church, and he's warning them, don't let this happen to you now because of what you've allowed to creep into your life. And it's the message to you and I today. You saw what God did with Israel. Don't let this creep into your life today. The solution is simple. Turn to the person next to you and say, I got this. That wasn't very good, actually. (laughs) I got this, right? I mean, I got this, man. I mean, idolatry, sexual immorality, I mean, I got this. Me in a good way, not in a bad way. I got this. The solution, I got this, is what I'm saying, right? Paul brings it home. He nails it. He nails this. He just simply and abruptly says this, no, right? Tell the person next to you, no. There you go. Ron is rubbing off on me. And that wasn't very good again. No, all right? There's a little bit of Ron right there. How do you stand against temptation, right? How do you stand? Well, this is what Paul says. No temptation can overcome you. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. God reminds you that your temptation is not unique. Millions and billions of brothers and sisters have gone through the same thing that you've gone through. And guess what? They got it. They beat it. They overcame. And so can you. If you're sitting here this morning going, man, I just can't beat it. You can beat it, people. You can win. No believer can claim that the devil made him do it. You know, no one, not even Satan, no one can make you do anything. You choose it. It's a willingness that you have on your part. You sin because you willingly sin. It's not out of your control. You're like, I want it. Even if you don't want it and you know better, you go, but I want it. I'm going to do it. It did not overcome you. The second one, no temptation's too much for you. You may feel like, oh, man, I was at this party. It was just too much for me to handle if you're younger, right? Everybody was doing it. Come on now, right? Dude, everybody cheats. Everybody's cheating with their money, their finances, taxes. You know, this is how you do business in today's world. Everybody, you know, you start coming up with all those things. No temptation is too much for you. You don't need to cave into it. Because guess what? God knows your weakness. He knows what's controlling your life. He knows your motives, your fears. He knows your spiritual maturity and your spiritual immaturity. And it says that no temptation is too much for you. When temptation comes, God says, I'm going to limit that. God limits the temptation that that he allows in your life. Knowing everything about you 
and your capability to not give in to it, God allows a temptation to come. According to your capability to rely on him and not on yourself. When you rely on yourself, it's like timber, right? You fall. But when you rely on him, God knows your capability. You can be victorious. You can overcome it. It's not too much for you. God knows what you can handle. He never gives you too much. And you can beat it if you rely on him. But then why does it keep happening? Because you want it. Because you choose it. When temptation comes, you've got three ways to beat it. Or you've got three ways to, to deal with it. The first one is this, man. You just give in to it. I mean, the world says, hey, you're not harming anybody. If it feels good, go ahead and do it. I kind of want it. I know it's not that big a deal. I've rationalized it. You know, it's not a big deal to me. You just give in to it. That's one way to respond to temptation. The second one is you fight it in your own strength. You know what? And you may do good sometimes. You're doing it, but then you fight and you fail. You fight and you fail. What's going to happen is that you're not going to be able to overcome temptation consistently on your own. You're not going to keep that battle and win it. If you could, you don't need Jesus. If you think you could do it on your own, then God did not need to send his son Jesus to die for you because you don't need him. And this might unfortunately be the way we're kind of living our life today, that we're trying to do it on our own because we're too afraid to ask for help or to let people know that we're struggling. Too much pride gets in the way of saying, I need help to beat this thing. Let me just say stop. Just stop right there. It doesn't have to be this way. Man, just reach out, get help, find an accountability buddy. You're not going to prison. You want to lead a better life, and someone's going to keep you accountable. Man, you need to confess and get honest with somebody. You know what lives in the darkness dies in the light. And that's why you want to get it out there. And the third thing that you can do to respond to sin, you can give into it, you can fight it on your own, or you can do it the better way. Dude, just overcome through the power of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Turn that temptation into victory. Man, I can tell you, when it's coming to me, I'm just like, I'm just going to say no. I have to talk myself into saying no. Can you believe that? I do. I, 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 I could be facing that temptation. I just got to be like, just, just say no. Don't do it. The last way to stand against temptation, and I love this part. It says that every temptation, there's a way out for you. I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come on up now. There is a way out for you. God says, I've made a way out. Yeah. See, it's not something that can overcome you. It's not too much for you. And I've given you a way out. Is that good news? You don't have to keep doing what you're doing. There's a way out. God says, I've given you an escape. It doesn't mean it's a disappearing act. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden God's going to take me out of the situation. And that's what we pray for. But that's not what it means. It doesn't mean God's going to take that alcohol out of your hands or the drugs out of your hands or that idol or whatever that immorality or whatever that sin is or that temptation. It doesn't mean he takes it out of your hands. What he says is, I'm going to give you a way out from this. And the way out is this. The way of escape leads you to the place where you're able to bear it. That's what that word means. The way of escape, no matter what it is, is going to be the same. It is through. Because there is no victory when you go around it. There's no victory when you say, God, get me out of this. The victory is when you can stand and say, no, man, I'm going to beat this. I'm not going to give in to it one more time. And that's where you grow and you get your strength is when you go right through. How many of you guys know that's the key to all of it? Just That's your escape. You just take like this tank and go, man, I'm just barreling right through this thing. Your way out is through. How many of you are just sick and tired of losing the battle? Sick and tired of it, man. Over and over again. It ain't a new one in my life. It's usually the same one over and over again. If you got this, and whatever that thing is that's bringing you down and making you fall, take a stand. Just say no. Just say, man, I got this. It can't overcome you unless you let it. It's not too much for you. You just give in. If enough's enough, I want you to stand right now. Just say, man, enough's enough. 
I'm going to receive the strength that God gives me. And I'm just going to worship the Lord right here, right now. If that's you, just stand to your feet right now. And let's worship.